I could just keep going on and on about how great it is. Um, I needed that. Oh, well, I'll find it. <laughs> uh, but I want to talk with us about a very hard thing today. Um, and that is, I, I want to talk to us, I want to spend some time thinking about what sin does to us. I think sometimes we underestimate the profound power of sin and just how devastating to our nature it is. That it isn't like a paper cut or even like an amputation. It's like being hit by a cannonball right in the chest. If that were to happen to you, if you were to be hit by a cannonball in the chest, what would they find? Yeah, not much. You know, sin is devastating to every bit of our personhood. It, it leaves us without real capacities to fix our problems. See, when, when, when we... We are born into this world full of sin. Every human being you ever meet has got a sin problem. Every last one of us. We all have it, including your parents. And because your parents had a sin problem, they raised you in a family with a sin problem. Guess what you developed? Yeah. And when it when we are raised up in a society loaded with sin and in a family loaded with sin, we don't escape that. It, it gets us. Long before we're culpable for our sins, we begin practicing our sins. You know, a child doing wicked things, it's still abhorrent, but it's not, the kid's not culpable. The parents are, Right? But we reach a point where all of us become aware, I've got a problem. And I've got a real problem. And I don't like this. I don't want this. And I can't fix this. You been there? Man. For some, for some folks, it's very obvious. Society acknowledges it. They look at it and go, yeah, that perm's got a problem. You know, the funny thing is they tend to be more fertile soil for the gospel, the, the refuse of society, the people that society throws away and says you're not worth it. God says, yeah, you are. You know, if, you are if you've struggled with chemical addiction or alcohol addiction or pornography addiction or, or something, actually, pornography tends to be really hidden. Society won't know about it. Yeah. It locks you away in that. But if you're in one of those broken places, society may throw you away. God does not. He does not. But many of us have more respectable sins. It's actually so much more dangerous. Honorable sins. You know, like a temper problem. Or you behave in ways that God would never behave, but only every once in a while, so it's not that big a deal. Except when you're home with your family, maybe it's, it's a lot more than that. But, you know. Or like I mentioned a moment ago, pornography tends to be one of those sins that we, we are able to, to do and hide, and the only person we talk about it with is maybe our preacher or our therapist. But, but nobody knows. Nobody knows. It's not really hurting anybody except that person that's on the screen who's probably dead. You know, you, just, you know how destructive it is? You're participating in her death, and, and you're taking it into yourself. Or maybe you're a habitual liar, or maybe you're full of greed and... and You know what your sin is. I don't have to describe it to you. Especially if you've put any effort into stopping. Right? If If you put any effort into reforming yourself, then you know what it is. And you know the hold it can have on you. Am I wrong? Isn't this the human condition? How do we deal with that? 
Well, actually, in a lot of ways, we're going to go very deep into that beginning next year. In January, we'll start tunneling deep into that. So, you know, keep coming. But this morning, I want to begin with looking at what we don't do about it. Because looking at what we don't do about it throws us back on the only resource we have, which is the Holy Spirit. There is not in you the capacity to... In Jesus Christ, your sins are forgiven. But in terms of transformation where you leave them behind, it's also in Jesus Christ by the Holy Spirit. It's the only way. The only way out of this problem, this cage, this prison that holds us is the Holy Spirit. I was raised by an alcoholic. He died when I was nine. It's pretty bad. You know what I saw before I was, actually before I was seven when he moved out? Um, because my mom was so afraid he was going to, because she loved him so much, but she was afraid he was going to kill her. So he moved out, and they end of in, ended up divorced, and then he died. And Do you know something I saw from him over and over again? Promises? I'll never touch another drop. Especially when my mom's face was bruised. I'm never going to do this again, Ann. I can't tell you how many times I heard that. <laughs> and he meant it. You know? And he wasn't, he wasn't lying to, to manipulate her. He meant every word he said. And he meant it, and he meant it, and he meant it. And when he was tempted, he meant it. And when the pressure built, he meant it. And, and when the booze took him, he still meant it. Why am I talking about that? You think he's lonely? That's the way sin works, folks. It is described in the Bible as a great power. And worse, it's, an ascribed, it's described as a, by, as a power that is attached to a part of us. Our flesh. That the sin has hold of us. Read through the book of Romans. In your NIV, anytime it says sinful nature, that's wrong. It should say flesh. Because that's what the Greek says. And your flesh isn't your sinful nature. It's your abilities. It's what you would use to succeed in life. It's your strength. It's your power. But it's corrupted. So your sinful nature in the NIV, your flesh in the Greek, is your sarks. That's not the stuff that you really want to do bad with. It's what you really want to do good with. It's what you want to use to live your life as a good person. It's your human efforts, your human abilities, and it is insufficient. We do not have it in ourselves to be alright. I mentioned earlier that it's like a cannonball. It doesn't just hit your moral capacities. Sin does damage to everything that you are, including your ability to reason, your, your emotions, your thoughts, everything. We are corrupted by this force, this power. Which means it's not in us to save ourselves. We can't do it. We do not have that capacity. By ourselves, we don't even have the ability to read the Bible and become obedient. You do it on your own, and it's going to go badly for you. Okay? The whole Christian game is one of openness to the Holy Spirit that we receive in our baptism. The entire thing. And without Him, without Jesus, what does Jesus say in, in John 15? Uh, you can't do very much? And that's not what He says. Without Me, you can do really cool paintings. Without me, you can do math. Without me, without me, you can do nothing. 
Nothing! My capacity to save myself is nil. It's zilch. I need a Savior. I am in desperate need of a Savior. And from heaven, one has come. God has sent the Savior. And He died for me and is risen for me. And He has poured out the Holy Spirit for me. And by the Spirit, He is with me. And He strengthens me. And He guides me. And He leads me. And He empowers me. He speaks to me from the Scriptures. And He reasons with my broken reasoning and realigns it and recreates it. I am not a really good guy. I am new creation. Or I am damned. I am new creation. Well, who created me? Me? Absolutely not. The Christian game is one of being thrown back onto the resources of another. And He empowers the resources that would otherwise destroy me. With Him, I can do all things. Without Him, I can do nothing. Now, why would I say that? Well, in the Gospel of John, we've been looking at the Gospel of John this year. It may have missed your notice. (laughs) We have been working our way through that Gospel this whole year. And we're into chapter 13. And in John chapter 13, we have this picture of a pretty good guy. I mean, really, he's a remarkably good man. He ends up preaching the first gospel sermon that is translated through the mouths of of his fellow apostles. and And it goes out into the world. First guy to preach it. First 10 or so chapters of Acts. Focus on him. Like He's the hero of that. Pretty good guy. He wrote a couple of books in your New Testament. First and Second Peter. Pretty amazing person, right? Peter's a better guy than I am. I, I hope to be as good at following Jesus as he is. But in John chapter 13 and then in chapter 18, we see a picture of how good that great man. Among the best of us, right? And the very best of humanity. How good is he on his own? Not so great. And like my dad, he meant it, and he meant it, and he meant it, until he couldn't. He absolutely means what he says. He's pulling on that power that you and I have if we try to live without God. Because the truth is, it's not like you're powerless. God created you. You were a made thing. Sin has corrupted you, but it didn't make you powerless. And you can put all kinds of efforts into it, but holiness is beyond your grasp as a sinner without the empowerment of the Holy Spirit. Without the saving work of Jesus Christ, none of us get there. And so we make disasters of our lives and our efforts to be good. Why do I say that? Because look at Peter. Look at this. Let's start actually a little before Peter comes into the picture. In uh, John chapter 13, verse 31, Jesus says, when he had gone out, Jesus, uh, that, that he, by the way, is, is uh, Judas Iscariot going out to, to betray him. Right? So when he had gone out, Jesus said, Now is the Son of Man glorified, and God is glorified in him. Why? Because he's betrayed now. Right? There's the glory of God, the betrayed God, who's able to love in the midst of betrayal. Right? Now he's glorified. If God is glorified in him, God will also glorify in him, him in himself and glorify him at once. Like It's happening, folks. It's coming right now. It's on its way. Little children, yet a little while I'm with you. You will seek me, and just as I said to the Jews, so also I say to you, where I'm going, you cannot come. Now I want to skip over a couple of verses, because we'll come to this, these verses in January, but I want you to see what he's done there. Is he's, Judas has gone out to betray him. It's night. Off Judas goes to get the people to come get him. Okay? He's only got a couple hours left with these guys. And then they're going to arrest him and they're going to kill him. So, and he's saying to them, I'm going somewhere you can't come. What's about to happen to me? You're not going to participate in it. Okay, I'm, I'm going to do all this by myself. Right? Well, look at Peter. Simon Peter said to him, Lord, where are you going? 
That's a pretty good question, right? Peter wants to be with Jesus. That's, a, that's admirable. And if he, Peter's being told you're not allowed to come, he's like, we'll see about that. Tell me where you're going so I can sneak in because I want to be with you. Told he's a good guy. Right? So Jesus answered him, where I'm going, you cannot follow me, but you'll follow afterward. Meaning, <laughs> Peter, don't worry, you're going to die soon enough. They're going to kill you too. Peter said to him, Lord, why can I not follow you now? I will lay down my life for you. Think he's lying? Is he just exaggerating? He's absolutely telling the truth. He's absolutely committed. He's absolutely convicted. And he's saying, I will use every bit of power that is in me to die with you. Rather, And why do I say I think he's telling the truth? Because in John chapter 18, when Jesus is getting arrested, right at the end of the arrest narrative, Simon Peter draws his sword and chops off somebody's ear. He means it. Okay, That act of violence, you suppose it could get him killed? And they got two swords in the whole bunch. And how many of those soldiers are there? How many does he have to take? It's interesting, he chopped off a servant's ear, maybe an unarmed man, you know. But he's, he's going to do it. He absolutely means it. He is entirely committed to it. Now why, you, you know the rest of the story, right? You can Paul Harvey this. For all of you under 30, Paul Harvey was this guy who used to be on the radio. Uh, look it up on Wikipedia. Anyway, you, you know the rest of the story. You can do this. right? In fact, just to make sure that you don't miss that, Jesus fills in the rest of the story. Will you really lay down your life for me? Truly, truly, I say to you, the rooster will not crow till you have denied me three times. And let's look at the rest of the story. Flip over to 18. John chapter 18, look at verse, verse 15. Simon Peter followed Jesus, and so did another disciple. So he meant it. He wanted to go where he was. Uh, since uh, the disciple was known to the high priest, he entered with Jesus in the courtyard of the high priest. But Peter stood outside at the door, and so the other disciple who was known to the high priest went out and spoke to the servant girl who kept watching and brought Peter in. And just how far are you willing to go, Peter? Uh, I'll stay outside, thank you very much. But no, this other one who's taking greater risks, he goes and gets him, brings him in. The servant girl at the door said to Peter, you also are one of this man's disciples, are you? He said, I am not. Skip down, verse 25. Now Simon Peter was standing and warming himself. With who? The villains. The enemies. Staying there warming himself, so they said to him, You're also, you also are not one of his disciples, are you? He denied it. He said, I am not. And one of the servants of the high priest, a relative of the man whose ear Peter had cut off, asked him, Did I not see you in the garden with him? And Peter again denied it, and at once a rooster crowed. The other gospels let us know that that broke Peter's heart. When he heard the rooster, he remembered what Jesus had said. He went out and he weeps bitterly, right? Have you been there? I swear to you, God, I am done with this. I promise you, I am done. And I will not do it again. And I will be a better person. And I will, I will not cause this damage to the world. I will be good. I will do it. I will. If you're going to take that approach, be prepared to weep bitterly. It does not work. It did not work for Peter. Christianity is not a do-it-yourself phenomenon where you, you build your righteousness by learning the right doctrines. How many right doctrines did Peter know? For goodness sakes, he's been with Jesus for years. He'd been listening to good doctrine for years. He, de- he relied on the wrong tools thought he could do it himself. And sin 
does not make us able to do that. Sin is a power that that is just bigger and stronger than we are. And if that were not the case, somebody explain the cross. If you could do it yourself, then why would he have to do that? He could just teach you the truth. He has already done that when the cross comes because the law of Moses existed. There's already a perfect law. And if we were able to overcome sin on our own, Judaism would have been sufficient. But the the Messiah has to come. And He has to die. And He has to be risen from the dead. Your hope at being repaired is Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit that He has given you. He can heal. He can redeem. He can restore the capacities you've damaged. The things that you've broken, He can, and He does it over time from one degree of glory to another. As we gaze upon Jesus, He transforms us into that image, all into the same image of Jesus Christ. This is the wonder of the Holy Spirit, but if you try to do this yourself, Peter would scream at you, don't! Don't, you can't! You're not good enough to be good enough. You're not, and you don't have to be. So often we want to, I will die with you. We want to boast to God about what, we want to do that because we want to be good enough to be loved. And we see in our sins the truth that I can't love someone who does what I do. I'm challenged by that. I'm broken in this. I don't, I don't like me. So how could He? He does. Because what He sees is that power working against you. And He sees you. And He knows who you are. Because He made you. He created you in His image. And He loves you. And He wants to restore what sin has broken. And He wants to make whole what's devastated in you. And so He poured out the Holy Spirit so that that power can give us the ability to have strength to succeed in obeying Jesus Christ. That's the strategy. And Peter stands at the fountainhead of of Jesus' discipleship teachings in the Gospel of John where he's going to teach us about the Holy Spirit and teach us about abiding in Christ and teach us what discipleship looks like spiritually. He's going to do that. But just before then, John wants to tell us, look, this is what it looks like when you do it yourself. And don't. Don't. Trust God. Put your hope in in Christ and follow Him and let the Spirit lead you and empower you because He can lead you to where yourself can never get you. You can't get there on your own, but you don't have to. You're not on your own. You are surrounded by a great cloud of witnesses that are rooting for you. Saints that have gone on before you. You are surrounded by the church that is praying for you and loves you. And more importantly than any of that, you have the Holy Spirit given to you at your baptism. He resides within you for the sake of your redemption. Trust Him. Pray. Follow Him. Meditate. And and engage with Him in those things. And let Him lead you to where only He can take you. Because putting our hope in the flesh leaves us outside warming ourselves with our demonic enemies. It leads us to coming again and again to the realization, I've blown it again. You've been there? coming again and again to our brokenness and running out into the dark to cry. You don't have to do that. Jesus Christ offers so much more than so many Christians are willing to settle for. We can, by His power and grace at work within us, we can be glorious. But we have to put our trust in something better than ourselves. And He could do that. If you've heard this sermon today and you're looking into yourself and going, oh man, I've been trusting the wrong things. You don't have to. 
No one will make you do that. You can walk with the Lord. You can, by the power of the Holy Spirit within you, live a transformed life. And if you want that, and you don't have that, let us pray for you and walk with Jesus. He'll give it to you. It may be that you came here today and you walked into this place and what I've talked about, it hasn't touched on the pain in your life, but there is pain in your life. Well, if that's the case, we want to pray for you. We want to minister to you and care for you. We hope you'll let us know. If you haven't started following Jesus, you have no hope of righteousness without him. He is your hope. But you have every reason to hope because he has come to rescue you. And come with us as we go with him. He's the best. He really is the greatest. Come with us. If this morning you're subject to the invitation of God, there's room here. Why don't you come while we stand and sing? We walk with